The title page of the Book of Mormon tells us <clears throat> why the book was written. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> in that great statement, it focuses on Christ and the need to prove to both Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. And then it says this, which is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, <clears throat> and that they may know the covenants of the Lord, and they are not cast off forever. Now that's one of the themes of the, of the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and in that respect, then, it, it fulfills and amplifies and gives further knowledge and information on great prophetic themes that we find in the Bible. Clear back in missionary days, I remember reading and reading over again Ezekiel's great statement <clears throat> concerning the gathering of Israel. But I don't think that regardless of how many times I then read it, that I really understood it until I began to see it <clears throat> within the context of the Book of Mormon. Now let me turn to Ezekiel chapter 20, <clears throat> beginning with verse 33. And the Lord's covenant now with Israel. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and I will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty arm and with a stretched out hand and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. And so they'll know what it's like. He says, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels <coughs> and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And then he goes on in <clears throat> verse 41 and says, I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered, and I will sanctify you before the nations, or before the heathen, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for uh, the which I lifted, you up, lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall, I remember, there shall ye remember your ways. And it goes on to say, verse 44, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought, uh, wrought with you uh, for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face out of the world. Well, he continues in that sense. But what I'm saying now is, <clears throat> when Israel is gathered, it is in a dark and cloudy day. It is in a day of fury poured out. <clears throat> it's a day then when he will bring them into the wilderness of the people and there plead with them face to face like he talked with Moses. It's a day then when he will purge out from among them the rebels and those that transgress against him. And it's a day then of the refiner's fire and the fuller soap. It's a day then when he prepares them to become his people and they'll have to be sanctified and really apply themselves with desire toward that end in order to just to hang on and finally to get there. Now that's the picture of Israel's redemption. And it comes out all over in the Book of Mormon, the great warfare against Zion the Isaiah prophecies, all of these, put it in that context. And uh, that says to us essentially that the day of Israel's gathering hasn't yet started. We've got a few of Ephraim, but the great day of gathering is a day when they're gathered out of uh, the nations with fury poured out in a dark and cloudy time. That's the time of Israel's redemption, see. And, uh, the Book of Mormon then helps us to understand that. Now, in order to see this picture a little more fully and clearly, <clears throat> I'd like to go with you to that famous allegory 
of the olive tree in Jacob chapter 5. I don't know how many of you have got that one mastered and understand all the details of it. <clears throat> if you read it carefully, you'll find that it was given by revelation. It wasn't just something that some bright soul in ancient Israel figured out. It was given by revelation. And the Lord then gave it. He who, as Joseph Smith puts it, uh, is in a condition of intelligence and foreknowledge where past, present, and future are and were with him one eternal now. And so in that context of knowledge, uh, Christ then dictated this great uh, allegory. I'd like to begin at the, the ending of it, if we can. I want you to see the end result before we start out in the beginning. Now, the end result is to establish Zion. And uh, uh, that's the reason for gathering Israel, to gather them to Christ, and not just to belief in Christ as a person, but to Christ as the King of Zion. And uh, not just to Christ in the sense of a historic figure whose teachings we now emulate, but to the living Christ who manifests himself with living power and living truth and testimony and gifts and fruits of the Spirit and finally sanctifies his people and endows them with glory here in mortality, the cloud and smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night, here in mortality and brings them into his presence and pleads with them face to face like he did Moses and sanctifies them and purges them and this then that they might come up to that standard. Now it's little wonder then that we need uh, opposition. It's little wonder that this will only be done really in uh, the day of warfare against Zion. It's little wonder that Nephi would say, I would, my brethren, you should know that all kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless the Lord makes bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, see. And we need then to see this situation and be getting prepared for it. But the end result, the end result is the establishment of a Zion society. Let's turn now to Jacob chapter 5, verse 72. A note here and read it clearly how Jacob portrays this as he brings this parable to a conclusion in... Uh, uh, explaining the end purposes of this great gathering that brings Israel back into Christ and into the order of Christ. Verse 72, he says, And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. In other words, the Lord is right here working, and he's in their midst. And they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. Now, obeying the commandments of the Lord in all things mean they put their lives on the altar. They were consecrated people. And they were not only working uh, to bring people to Christ, they were implementing the order so that they could obey. You can't really fully obey the mechanics, for example, of the law of consecration until you establish the order. Every person ought to be in the posture of consecration and ought to move in that direction and conduct ought to be in that direction. Otherwise, uh, you may have some question on the, uh, your compliance with the sacred covenants of the house of the Lord. If you get your hand going one day and your pocketbook another way, uh, they're not in harmony with each other. All right, so they... they uh, keep all the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. And that includes the Zion order. And they're building it, see. And there began to be, uh, to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard. Now, what is the natural fruit? Well, the natural fruit consists of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the endowments of the Spirit, the blessings of the gospel that come and that flow from regenerated souls, and the Lord places and implants among the saints when they truly live and have the Spirit of the Lord, and there's a union and a brotherhood and a sisterhood, see? And when that uh, uh, union then is based on the living manifestations of the Spirit and enhanced by it and quickened and enlightened 
by it. See, that's, those are the fruits of the Spirit, see, uh, under the natural branches. And he says, the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly, and the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away. And that's the order of the building. You, you give people the opportunity, bring them in. If they become wild branches instead of good, you do some pruning, or else you cut them back. You work then with them to unfold them, but if they, if they won't unfold in the right way, then, then there's no alternative. You can't be a part of the Zion order and believe only in the latter and do only the social things. You've got to be a part of the thing spiritually in order to, to receive of the life, and the substance of the gospel seed. And he says, And they did keep the root and the top thereof equal according to the strength thereof. Uh, sometimes, for example, we get all caught up in the imaginations of the mind. Uh, we can do this by reading scripture. You can get the vision of Zion so full in your mind that you're way up there. You're way up there. You're not down to reality. And so he's talking then about uh, pruning things. You prune them and you keep the root where the spiritual strength and power and the top there are equal in balance and uh, one according to the strength of the other. And that's the way you build, see. That's the way you build. And he says, And thus they labored with all diligence according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard, even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard, and the Lord had preserved unto himself uh, that the trees had be had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. And they became like unto one body. Now this is the Zion order. They become like unto one body, and the fruits were equal. And the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruits which was most precious unto him from the beginning, see. Now that equality then is, is not a leveling down. That equality is a leveling up. That equality is not a stifling lockstep program like collectivism. That equality then is when a righteous person consecrates not only his service, but his pocketbook to the proposition that all others can have an equal access to take care of their obligations to their family. The Zion Society doesn't take care of your family. It's not a system that coddles this from the womb to the tomb. It's not that kind of thing. That's collectivism. It's that kind of thing that regenerates souls and teaches them to love their neighbor as, not better, not less, as themselves, and to translate that principle into the realm of economics, and to set up a storehouse that's based on this proposition, that every person who consecrates becomes an heir, has a right to a stewardship, has the right to draw upon that storehouse, to operate and manage his stewardship, and has an equal opportunity to advance in the economic aspects of life. Now, some people may take that who have great gifts, for example, in economic uh, uh, spheres, and they might build great uh, economic empires. They still consecrate all the surplus, and they still turn it to the storehouse. They can still have equal right to draw upon the storehouse, which means they may draw much more because their business is much larger and has much greater needs. But who's to say that's more valuable? than the man who wants to commit his life to the knowledge of Christ and the teachings of Christ's sacred principles, and instead of becoming merely a, a great economic genius who wants to learn how to teach the words of eternal life and apply them. That doesn't sometimes make him very much money. Under the law of consecration, he uh, would have some means of remuneration. There'll be an educational system and all of that, see. but. Uh, there are, various, there are various kinds of stewardship. People find fulfillment in many ways. A person who is a tremendous economic genius can add great strength to a community and be a mighty powerful pillar in a given community if he consecrates and if his genius is used not only to build a great empire of consecrated property under himself as steward, but if he elevates others to that opportunity, teaches them how, gives them the genius, gives them the support, see, 
And in that sense, that's very valuable. But uh, it may be questionable whether it's as valuable as uh, the person who learns the prophetic gifts. The prophet Yoda Smith never acquired very many uh, uh, things of value in the economic world. Didn't have too much. It cost him literally thousands upon thousands of dollars for legal fees. The lawyers filched him out of in Missouri in order to clear up that whole kind, that whole episode. And it left him a man of poverty. And when he went to Nauvoo to lay out the land there, he didn't have any money, and yet he went there to buy the whole area. And uh, there were some other brethren who were present and around. They had a little money in their pocket, and he didn't have any. And yet he was there purposely now to the place, or a large chunk of it. And uh, as he sat there talking, waiting now for this minute meeting to take place where he's going to purchase this property, another gentleman rode up and says, I'm looking for Joseph Smith. And uh, he says, well, I'm the man. He says, uh, do you own all this property? Joseph says, well, I'm just right in the process of buying it. That's a lot of faith. <clears throat> the person says, I'd like to buy this piece over here, large piece over here, and I'm ready to pay you gold for this right now. How much do you want? Well, that little chunk, uh, just buying it as a lot and so forth, it was a little more in price per acre than others. And so the prophet told him, and he delivered the money to him, and uh, went his way with the deed to that particular piece of property. And then the gentleman came up from whom the prophet was buying the whole property, and the prophet put down a good husky uh, down payment on the program and got things moving, see. Now, Joseph didn't have too much money, but the Lord kind of took care of him. He's, uh, he's uh, with his wife Emma in the evening one day, sitting down to an empty table for almost for, for a dinner or a meal. And they've got a little Johnny cake there, and that's all they've got. The prophet uh, bows his head and says very thankfully, but with great persuasion to the Lord, Lord, we thank thee for this Johnny cake, and we pray that you bless us with something else before we get through eating it. And they started, and then the door, a knock came to the door, and a good brother came to the door and says, Brother Joseph, I've been thinking about you, and I've got a couple of extra hams and a few other things here, and I've got this unloaded out here, and I'd like to give it to you. And so he delivered it, and the prophet sat back down, cut off a slap of the ham, and said to his wife, Emma, I knew the Lord would answer my prayer, see. So he didn't have too much then in the way of economics in a lot of ways. But who can place a value on what he gave to us? Who can place value on that? Who can place a value on the Doctrine of Covenants, which was said is worth in value the entire wealth? of the world if you had to use that to purchase it, see. Now, stewardships differ, and rewards differ, and, uh, and yet in, every, in the exercise of gifts they can differ, and yet they can all contribute to the happiness and the welfare of Zion. And so Jacob then begins this great allegory by uh, dealing now with Israel in her scattered state, and giving us this beautiful uh, allegory with the end objective in mind of teaching us how Israel is going to be gathered to Christ and to the order of Christ, which is the order of Zion. Now, that's the idea. Now, it begins not with uh, uh, later times. Its origin is with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you need to note that in order to get properly oriented as you study it. Uh, begins there with these statements. Verse 2, Hearken, O ye house of Israel, and hear the words of me, a prophet of God. Now note how he puts that in the English. Hear the words of me. He doesn't say, hear my words. He said, hear the words of me. Now, here the words of me is the exact rendition and translation of the Hebrew without changing the idiom. You know, the Spanish say the clock walks, and we say it runs, and down in Samoa they say, I love you with all my liver, and <laughs> that doesn't sound very good to me. I'd rather love them with all my heart. 
but there's a difference of idiom, and the prophet translated without worrying too much about the idiom. And so he starts out, hear the words of me, uh, a prophet of the Lord, for behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, uh, liken to a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, and it grew and waxed old and began to decay. Now write Egypt right there. That's where it began to decay. And uh, it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth, and he saw that his olive tree began to decay, and he said, I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it, and perhaps may many short roots then, uh, many, perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches. Now, have you ever seen an olive tree? If you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, you can see an olive tree or two there that was there when Christ was there in that sacred moment of uh, redemptive agony. If you go there, it's still there. But an olive tree, they, they have little shoots that shoot out from them. And uh, uh, they form new limbs, and you can take those, you can take those new shoots and take them out and plant them and get yourself a new one. And so he's using then this symbol now of a tame olive tree that puts forth its shoots. And uh, uh, these then, uh, uh, he uses symbolically to depict then various branches of Israel. Now much then of this allegory is general. It deals then with the, the departure of groups of people out of Egypt during the Egyptian bondage. It deals with groups of people that later left. It deals with the whole scenario of Israel then, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, clear on down through. And the basic idea is that there are groups that leave, and then there are groups that are brought in, and they're wild olive trees, and they're grafted in. And then with that general view of things, then he focuses on four major groups, and these four major groups are both symbolic and literal in their meaning. Symbolic of the general picture of, of uh, Israelite groups leaving, and literal in the sense that they are speaking of literal individual groups. But these aren't the only ones. They are, they're, they're, they're dominant, they're major, they figure in the scattering, and they will figure in the gathering. And they will figure in the gathering in the pattern and program and format of things laid down in this allegory. Now let me turn, for example, to chapter 5, verse 20. And it came to pass that they went forth whither the master had to hid the natural branches of the tree. And he said unto the servant, Behold these, and behold the first, that it had brought forth much fruit, and he beheld also that it was good. And he said unto the servant, Take of the fruit thereof, and lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto mine own self. For behold, said he, this long time have I nourished it, and hath brought, it hath brought forth much fruit. Now that's the first planting. And uh, it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, How comest thou hither to plant this tree, or this branch of the tree? For behold, it was the poorest spot in all the land of the vineyard. This wasn't too productive. There was a lot of cobble rocks around, and uh, uh, not really a lot of uh, uh, productivity so far as the natural resources of the area is concerned. Uh, but the Lord says unto him, Counsel me not, for I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Wherefore I said unto thee, I have nourished it this long time, and thou beholdest that it has brought forth much fruit. Now that, that is talking then about a specific group of Israel being planted in a specific spot. And we'll leave it there for a minute and come back. Now, verse 23, he talks about the second specific group. And he says, And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Look hither, 
Behold, I have planted another branch of the tree also. And thou knowest that this spot of ground was poorer than the first. So you got a worse situation in the sense of natural wealth and resources, etc. And he goes on to say, But behold the tree, but behold the tree. I have nourished it this long time, and it hath brought forth much fruit, therefore gather it and lay it up against the season that I may preserve it unto mine own self. All right, and so this second group then was planted on an even poorer spot of land. But that poor spot of land, as their basis, spiritually, they brought forth then uh, an abundance of fruit. And the fruits then are the gifts of the Spirit and the spiritual blessings. See, Now, in verse 24, it talks about the third group, and this is a specific group planted in a given land. And it says, And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said again unto his servant, Look hither, and behold another branch also, which I have planted. Behold, that I have nourished it also, and it hath brought forth fruit. And that's about all he says of that one. And then the fourth group then he speaks of here in verse 25. And he said unto the servant, Look hither, and behold the last. Behold, I, this have I planted in a good spot of ground. And I have nourished it this long time, and now only a part of the tree hath brought forth tame fruit. This thing was divided so that part of it brought forth tame fruit and part of it brought forth evil fruit. Uh, he says, And the other part of the tree hath brought forth wild fruit. Behold, I have nourished this tree like unto the others. All right, he sees then these four groups of people. And uh, the first two are planted on a, a rather unproductive area. Uh, the first bad and uh, the second bad bad, <laughs> or worse. And then the third, he doesn't really identify what the situation is, assuming it's not quite like the other. And the fourth then is planted in a good spot, a choice land. And uh, this branch then divides into two portions. One then becomes wild and ferocious, etc., and the other is a goodly branch. Okay, now, he goes on, and as he talks then about the gathering of these fruits after they, they've been good for a while, and then he visits them down the road a ways, and he finds out that they're all corrupt, and the fruit has gone bad on them. And uh, he's got a dilemma. And so the upshot of the matter is that he's going to perform a replanting uh, and regrafting operation, and uh, he's going to bring them now from their scattered state on back. And he says this in verse 39 now <clears throat> about the sequence. And I want you to see this so that you get the basis of identifying who these, who these groups are. In verse 39, it came to pass that they went down into the nether parts of the vineyard, and it came to pass that they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become corrupt also, yea, and the first, and the second, and the last, and they had all become corrupt. Now note then, he only mentions the second, the first, and the second, and the last. There's only three groups now instead of four. The first, the second, and the last. And the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which brought forth good fruit. In that last one, which was originally the fourth and now is the third, uh, the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which was brought forth good fruit. So the good fruit had died off, and the wild was running around uh, uh, with their bows and arrows. <coughs> I can give you a key. <clears throat> okay, now he goes on then, seeing having become corrupt, and uh, he deals now with these in the sense now of the redemptive work. And uh, he says this, let's turn to verse uh, uh, 52, Wherefore let us take of the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost part of my vineyard, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came. And let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit 
uh, is most bitter and graft in the natural branch of the tree in the stead thereof. And behold, let's go on down to verse 54, and behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree which I planted whithersoever I would are yet alive. There is still substance uh, spiritually. There's still something in regard to uh, basic deep qualities in Israel blood and, and uh, uh, the roots then in Christ and all of that. That's still alive, see. And he says, Behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree which I planted with us where I would are yet alive. Wherefore, I may preserve them, that I may preserve them also in mine own purpose. I will take the branches of this tree, and I will graft them into them. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree. All right, now, in relation to this whole thing, as the Lord then begins to develop this program, uh, in relation to this whole scenario, then let's go back and just pick up another verse here that we need to see. Verse 42, Behold, I knew that all the fruits of the vineyard, save it were these, had born, become corrupt. And now these which have off once brought forth good fruit have also become corrupted, and now all the trees of my vineyard are good for nothing. And then explain what to be done. He says, And behold, this last, whose branches hath withered away, I did plant in a good spot of ground, even that which was choice unto me above all other parts of the land of my vineyard. And thou beheldest that I also cut down that which cumbered the spot of ground, that I might plant this tree in the stead thereof. Now this last branch then is what? It's the colony of Lehi, right? And uh, they divide. Part of them are become natural fruit, and part of them become the wild olive tree. And the Lord speaks of this last group, and he says he put them in a land that was choice above all other lands, right? And then he says also in verse 44, And thou beholdest that I also cut down that which cumbered the spot of ground. Now what did he cut down? And the answer is the Jaredites, and destroyed them from off that land so that they would have a free program for development without the corruption of that earlier civilization which had corrupted itself, see? And he says, Thou beheldest that a part thereof brought forth good fruit, and a part thereof brought forth wild fruit, and because I plucked not the branches thereof and uh, cast them in the fire, behold, they have overcome the good branches uh, that they have withered away. And so the, the Lamanites finally then killed off all the Nephites. All right, now you've got some insight into uh, a specific group of the, uh, of the uh, uh, people in this particular parable, see. You've got some uh, specific insight into them. And uh, as you see then that picture unfold, as you see that unfold, then uh, you see the Lord beginning his work and carrying it out in uh, the gathering and redemptive power uh, of the gospel to gather people to Christ and to uh, bring them back in. All right, now let me give you a few keys and a few clues here that may be helpful. Uh, in this gathering process, it's done on the principle that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And so when he begins to gather them, then he gathers the last first. And this is a key now to the redemption of Israel. And he, he scatters them from one, two, three, four. The, uh, the last is the colony of Lehi. The third is the Mulekite colony. But the third merges with the last. And so you finally are only dealing with three, the first, the middle, and the last. You see that? And when you come then to the gathering, then... Uh, uh, the Lord works on the operation of uh, the last being first. Note how he puts it. Let's turn to verse 62. He says, Wherefore, let us go and labor with our might this last time. For behold, the end draweth nigh, and this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. Graft in the branches, begin at the last that they may be first. 
Okay, now where do you start the great gathering and the program of redeeming Israel? You begin them with, with the Lamanites, the Lehites, right? Guard with the last, that they may be first, and the first may be last. Now, in the whole scenario of Israel's redemption, which is the last group that's going to be gathered to Christ? And the answer is not just the Jews, it's the house of David. It's the house of David. All right, uh, and then what other major body does that leave us? It leaves the ten tribes. Okay? Now, in the, in the process then of scattering, the Lord in these four groups that were scattered first then took the house of David and he planted it in Jerusalem. Now, the first time I hit that idea, I didn't believe it. I said, uh-uh, it can't be right. And I argued on it, even though I knew where the Spirit of the Lord was supporting it. I was still arguing it. That can't be, because I had just taken, just taken Jerusalem uh, as a center and the Jews and said, hey, that's it. Now, you've got to start with the beginning of that parable. And you start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you start with getting Israel in Egypt. And then you recognize, and I went back through and plowed through all the evidence historically on this in order to wrestle this thing out, and then you, then you, you go to Egypt for 400 years, and then you deliver them out of Egypt, and you go somewhat to the land of Canaan, but they don't clear the whole thing away, and they're under the reign of judges for a long time, and they almost, many of them apostatize. And it's literally hundreds of years after Moses that David finally conquers Jerusalem and takes her from the Jebusites and plants a select body of people there. See, in the situation that existed between David and Saul, Saul having been anointed to be king of Israel and then having corrupted himself so that the Lord rejected him, then uh, Samuel went out into the country, found the family of Jesse, David's father, lined up his boys, he says, here's the one I will take. And he anointed David then, this young boy, this ruddy-faced boy, anointed him to be king of Israel. Well, that knowledge became known, and Saul made war against him. And David gathered to himself a body of people who were loyal. And they were loyal not just to David as a person, they were loyal to Jehovah. They were loyal to God. They were... Uh, people then who were committed to righteousness. And uh, later then David took that body of people, people then who were his family and those who were adopted to him under the gospel program. Uh, I think the evidence would support probably that. They were bonded to him, at least in the covenants of the gospel and in the spirit of the gospel. And he conquered Jerusalem. And then he planted that group of people there, and that is the first. Now, where is the others of Israel? Well, they're still back down here, but, but Jerusalem now, you, we try to think this planting is way off somewhere, you know. The first planting was in Jerusalem, and that's the last body to be gathered, because Christ came to his own, and his own received him not, see? All right, now the second great... Uh, uh, but planting then consists then of the, t the ten tribes. And uh, we need to keep in mind that in relation to the ten tribes, there are two different, there are two basic uh, points that need to be understood. One is that there are many of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, that are scattered throughout all the world, and that's the gist of the, of the allegory that they were groups that went out, and then there were Gentile elements that were brought in and made part of it, see. There were groups that, uh, that, were, that were scattered, and they're scattered all over the world, and they are not in a body. But when we read the 10th article of faith, for example, which says, we believe one in the literal gathering of Israel, two, and in the restoration of the 10 tribes. See, there's two different functions. And if you turn to section 109, or 10 rather, where uh, Moses uh, restored keys then concerning this whole work, it says just simply and plainly that uh, 
verse 11, that Moses appeared before us and committed unto us the keys, one of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and to the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. Now, I've gone into journals, handwritten accounts, hundreds of them relating to people who lived in Joseph Smith's day and who recorded many times in their journals what he taught. Uh, in the Spring Conference of 1831, the prophet filled with the Spirit said that John the Revelator uh, was now among the ten tribes and that he was working and doing a preparatory work. There are some journal sources related to that that indicate that John the Revelator had appeared to the prophet Joseph and they had an hour and a half conversation or so. And John told the prophet that he was king and priest among that people. They were talking about a body of people. You see that? You're talking about a body of individuals. The prophet was very familiar with uh, the ancient patriarchs and prophets much more than we think, much, much more than we think. And on a familiar basis, we think of the coming of Peter, James, and John in, in uh, 1829 and say, well, that's all that would happen there. But no, Peter and John were in the Kirtland Temple for a long time together. On one occasion, the prophet is driving down the road in a wagon with a good brother, and they see a man step out from the side of the road, and the prophet says, uh, as they draw near to him, why don't you hold up here, and I want to go down and talk with that gentleman, and I'll be back a little later. Well, the person who was driving was also his bodyguard, and he was very much concerned, but the prophet assured him it would be all right. So he gets out and walks down the road and talks with this guy for a while, and the person then to whom he's speaking finally disappears off into the woods, and the prophet goes back and gets on the wagon. And as the conversation resumes, the prophet says, do you know who that was? And the person, his companion, traveling companion, says, no, I don't know him. He says, well, that was John the Revelator, see him. Then you have the prophet saying in, in Missouri, I was talking to the apostle Peter the other day, and this is what he told me. Now, the prophet is just that familiar, just that familiar, see. If you wanted to know what Adam looked like, the prophet could and did on more than one occasion describe him. And he wasn't next door to some baboon, believe me. Adam was a perfect physical specimen. He had a strength and an agility and a quickness. One good brother said to the prophet, the prophet said that he never uh, dropped a knee or a joint to the ground. And when he went out hunting, he just kind of ran him down. <coughs> And uh, he was a very powerful individual. On one occasion, uh, the prophet's older brother, Alvin, uh, was standing around a ring and a couple of men were wrestling. And uh, uh, one of them was taking advantage of the other by using his thumbs to gouge his eyes. And that so infuriated Alvin that he stepped into the ring, grabbed that guy by the nab of the neck and the seat of the britches, and just hoisted him bodily over top of the men standing around and threw him out in the meadow on the side. Now, that takes a pretty husky man to do that. But the prophet Joseph talking about it says, Now, my brother Alvin, he was a handsome man, and he was also a powerful man. He was a lot like, like Adam. It looked like him, and he was a powerful man like Adam, see? And then he converses with him. Good sister up in New York, for example, had been converted to the church, and and after her conversion, had a marvelous spiritual experience where she was taking care of her dishes and so forth in the kitchen, and the vision opened, and uh, she saw a man, majestic and stately, and uh, some other things. And this so astonished her that she just didn't tell it to anyone. She mentioned it briefly to her family, but she just kept it to herself for fear that it might be something that was out of line. But it so happened that the prophet was traveling through there on his way east on a mission. He was going to the east. He stopped into that home, and this good sister then took the opportunity to confide that experience in him. And this was about 1832, as I recall, or thereabouts. And the prophet said this as he heard the story. He says, yes, that vision is genuine, and the person you saw was Adam. I have seen him, he says, several times. And as you describe him, that was Adam. All right, now the prophet then 
has a conversation with John the Revelator, and it's about the ten tribes. You think that the prophet knows anything about where the ten tribes come from? I've collected materials then where the prophet maybe speaks in just a personal home, and someone says, I went to hear Joseph Smith, and he talked on the restoration of Israel, and this is what he said. And uh, believe me, they are in a body. When Jesus said to the Nephites that he was going to go visit the ten tribes, he didn't say he was going on an extensive tracting spree through North in Europe and Asia. He didn't say that. He went and visited a body of people. And that body of people then was the second planting in the allegory of the olive tree. And it's a specific body, and it will be returned as a specific body. And they will come to Zion. But they will come when? After the redemption of Zion and after uh, the Lord has uh, uh, established the center place of the New Jerusalem. Can you hand me those, honey? Uh, then he will bring in the ten tribes. Now, there's, there's two or three official statements telling us uh, scripturally about the coming of the ten tribes. One of them is in 3rd Nephi 21. And let me just give you this uh, in order to establish the, the prophetic context for it. In this particular chapter, we discussed it here the other day in relation to the Assyrian and the judgments foretold on this land if the Gentiles do not repent. But then in whether they repent or whether they don't, the new Jerusalem is going to be built. And he talks about is coming then to the, to the new Jerusalem. Verse 24, And then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in and to the new Jerusalem. Now, the new Jerusalem isn't just a city in Jackson County. One of the uh, lost revelations, can I put it that way, or whether it was recorded or not, I don't know. But sometime in the fall, of 1830, the prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation concerning the New Jerusalem. Uh, I've never seen a copy of that, but there are letters written uh, out of that era of time that describe some of the salient points in it. In one letter written from Fayette to uh, uh, the saints in Kirtland, they talk about the New Jerusalem. And they say, in substance, you folks are living on the border of the New Jerusalem. And that the New Jerusalem will exist from the Appalachian Mountains westward to the Pacific. And it will have no north and south boundary. Now, the New Jerusalem is not a spot of ground in Jackson County. That is the city of the New Jerusalem. That is the center place of the New Jerusalem. But the center place, then, is an administrative hub. And as I said earlier, there's a high council in Zion, spoken of in section 107 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And that high council in Zion actually is a general authority body. And it has ecclesiastical power to uh, direct the program of the order of Zion that centers now in the city of the New Jerusalem. And the idea is that you build up one city, 15 to 20,000 people, <coughs> with enough supporting uh, elements around in the way of agricultural lands or other productive uh, natural resources to sustain a city of 15 to 20,000 people. And each city is a state. Each city is a stake. Now, we've modified that a little. The prophet Joseph Smith, for example, as he sent a pattern and a plan uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this program of Zion, sent with them a copy of the plat of the city of Zion, and with an explanation of how it ought to be laid out, 
Now this plat he was given by vision. He saw it. He saw it in vision, and he wrote down in vision what it was. And this now is the plat of the center place or the city of Zion. And then he makes this explanation. This is the teachings, page 24. He says, in relation to the size of bishoprics. Now we think of a bishopric of a ward, but uh, leave that idea alone just for a minute. Uh, in relation to the size of bishoprics, when Zion is once properly regulated, when you get things really there in, in organization and design and program, he says there will be a bishop to each square. Now the square is the city. There will be, there'll be a bishop over a city. This is a stake bishop, okay? There will be a bishop o to each square of the size of the one that we send you with this. But at present, it must be done according to wisdom. Now, the wisdom principle is the one we've been operating on because we never brought Zion up to the full stature and standard, see. But in Joseph Smith's day, whenever they laid out a stake, the stake was a city. Kirtland was a stake. And it was the stake then of the city of Kirtland and so forth. When they went then to, to far west, it was a stake. They laid out Adam on Diamond as a stake. They laid out several of these, some of which they never got around to uh, be even beginning to build, one or two of them at least, uh, before they were driven out of Missouri. They went then to, to Nauvoo and they laid out a stake. And you had hundreds and thousands of people gathered there and it was still just one stake. And then over on the other side of the river, they laid out a stake then in Zarahemla. Now that idea of a stake as a city continued, see. And as the saints moved out to the west, then they came out to Salt Lake City and they established a stake, one stake. And that one stake grew in size and so forth until eventually there were 36 wards in it. And the state president was doing about as much as the president of the church. And finally then, the brethren went back and says, well, what did Joseph say? This thing has got to be done according to wisdom until, until we get the full program in gear. And so then they made stakes based on appropriate numbers. You see that? They based stakes on that base. Now, where did the word ward come from? You don't find it scripturally. When they went to Nauvoo, they laid out a stake. The prophet wrote the Nauvoo Charter. Uh, he used as a basis of the Nauvoo Charter uh, the, the document giving the Springville, Illinois Charter. He used the Springville, Illinois Charter as, as a basis. And then he modified it and rearranged it to bring into Nauvoo some unique ideas relating to freedom and human association so that it's essentially a new creation except for the scaffolding and the, and the basic outline. Now, in the Nauvoo Charter, taken from the Springville Charter, the city was divided into wards. And these were municipal divisions. They were municipal divisions uh, for the purpose then of managing the concerns of the city. All right, as the saints moved in under that kind of arrangement in the Charter, then uh, bishops were selected we're doing things now according to wisdom. See, we're not doing the full program, but bishops were selected to preside over a ward. And so you begin to have a ward bishop. My great granddad is one of those ward bishops in, in Nauvoo, you see. And so the word ward came into our, into our use. But in the original idea then, the original idea is that a city of fifteen to 20,000 people is a stake and this is under the law of consecration and stewardship and each stake has a storehouse and each stake has a stake bishop whose full-time employment is the operation of that storehouse under the law of consecration and stewardship the revelations also provided that bishop c should be presidents of quorums of priests, and that's 48 of them. So there are different kinds of bishops. There's a bishop who's a president of a quorum, 
of priests, 48 in number. And there's a bishop then who is the uh, presiding officer uh, of the storehouse under the United Order Council that was set up there, see. And in that sense, that's the original plan. That's the original design and the original plan. And I suspect then the idea of wards and ward bishops is compatible as units within this whole stake of 15 to 20,000 people with a bishop then over a given ward area, see. But uh, you have to study this out in that sense now. All right, so getting back to this then, the New Jerusalem then is laid out, and the New Jerusalem is, is not just a place in Jackson County. That's the city of the New Jerusalem. That's the city of the New Jerusalem, and that's the center place, and it's supported by stakes, and the symbol is like a tent. A tent has a center place, and then it has cords out, and it has supporting stakes out to hold it. Now, the tent is not a stake. It's a place. It's an administrative unit, and the stakes then are supporting things. So Isaiah says, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. Coming back to Isaiah 54, which we talked about yesterday. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. You see that? So lengthen, uh, uh, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. He's talking about the growth and development of Zion. And the idea then in the prophet's mind was that the whole of America is Zion, north and south. And that the design is that you lay off one city of Zion after another. You don't have the great big metropolises with their slums and all the social problems related to them. You don't do that in the Lord's program. You lay off one city after another, make it self-sustaining economically, and each city has a storehouse under the law of consecration, and each city has a temple. And that temple is not just to do work for the dead, but it also has place then for the school of the prophets and, uh, and uh, for the teaching and the instruction of the saints. And this then is the design of things. Can you see that? And that idea is and that you lay these cities off all over America. Now, when the, when the New Jerusalem is built up and begins to be built up, then the Lord, speaking of that, says, Then shall they assist my people that may be gathered in who are scattered upon the face line in unto the New Jerusalem. Are you going to bring all the Indian people into Jackson County? And the answer is no. The New Jerusalem is going to be built up in Central America and in South America. And so you bring the people in, give them their sacred temple rights and blessings and privileges and sealing powers and all that, and tell them to go build a city of Zion back there in Central America and so forth, see? And that's the New Jerusalem, see, with its center place somewhat in the center of the land, its center place in the center of the land. All right, now, when that program gets in gear and gets underway, then the Lord says, then shall the work of the Father commence at that day. Now, there's a point of reference. Even when this gospel will be preached among the remnant of this people, and keep in mind now he's talking to the Indian people, and in this gathering sequence, you gather Lehi's children first, you bring the ten tribes in second, and then finally with the coming of Christ to the Mount of Olives, you bring in the house of David and the Jewish people. See, the first planting now <clears throat> is the planting of David's in Jerusalem, and that's going to be the last one that will be delivered. The second planning is the ten tribes. And uh, while they went into Assyria at the fall of Nineveh, then they fled that area. They fled on up through between the Black and the Caspian Sea through the Caucasus Mountains there. And uh, they dumped off into uh, southeastern Europe. And then as you study European history, there's three great migrations in European history, one of which the main body of which that concerns with European culture now began just shortly after this, these people, these uh, 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 fleeing people from, from uh, Assyria dumped off into there, and there were literally hundreds and thousands of them. Then one migration went on up into the uh, northern area, into the woods of Germany, and they were individual tribes. Some significant tribes that are important to us. One is the, the Angles and the Jutes and the Saxons. And about 450 uh, A.D., then they finally settled 
in the British Isles, and we call them the Anglo-Saxons or the Anglo-Saxons, see. And they have, according to Brigham Young and others, very strong segments of Israel blood in them and of Ephraim. You see that? Now, meantime, apparently, there was another group then that just decided that that they were really going to do the gospel program, which they had never done in their own homeland. And so they gathered uh, themselves together and they moved on northward, on up through into Scandinavia and from there on. And we'll leave them at that point and they become the lost tribes. And they're in a land that's poorer than the land of Jerusalem. Thing. And they will come from the general area from whence they, uh, we finally last have any knowledge of them. And you say, well, where are the ten tribes? Well, they're lost. And uh, I don't know that I better go any further on the subject than that, but they are lost. But they will come then in a body. And they will come after, note what he says, uh, when shall the work of the Father commence at that day, even when this gospel will be preached unto this people, verily I say unto you, at that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people, even the tribes which have been lost, which the Father hath led away, not scattered, led away out of Jerusalem. Yea, the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people. Now that's one statement we've got scripturally to tell us about the return of the ten tribes. Another one is in uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 133. And this one then uh, speaks of their coming in rather graphic terms. Uh, it says this in verse uh, uh, 26, And they who are in the north countries shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves. And they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall fall down at their presence. And an highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. I remember when I was a kid uh, in a rural community, a lot of good souls who loved the gospel that didn't know too much about what the scripture said, and the Alaskan Highway was under construction, and we had a few good testimony meetings in which they bore testimony of gratitude for living in the last days when that highway was being built for the return of the ten tribes. <coughs> now bless their souls. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that a highway shall be cast up, cast up, in the midst of the great deep. The deep is the ocean. This is a cataclysmic happening. And it will be down this highway from which they will come. It says, and in this disruption that takes place, and this is one of the great cataclysmic events of the last days. They don't all happen when Christ stands on the Mount of Olives. There's a whole series of them, as the prophet Joseph taught. He says, and, and in barren deserts shall there come forth pools of living water, and the parched land ground shall no longer be a thirsty land. And they shall bring forth their rich treasures and to the children of Egypt from my servants, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. Now, the everlasting hills are that chain of mountains that goes from the north to the south pole. And there's only one place on earth where that happens, and that's in, in America. It comes on down through, and it's the everlasting hills, from everlasting to everlasting, so far as the uh, earth is concerned. Now, the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And then, speaking of their return, and there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. Now, a lot of people have the idea that when they come, we're going to convert them to the gospel. Now, that's not true. They're not going to come to get converted to the gospel. They say we're going to come and they're going to give them their temple endowments and their marriage. That's not true. That's not what it's saying. What does it say? Let's read it again. Verse 32. And there in Zion shall they fall down and be crowned with glory. Now, what does it mean to be crowned with glory? Well, that's the endowment of glory, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. What must they have before that? 
what must they then be prepared with prior to that so that they, when they come to Zion can get those final things with the endowment of glory? What must they have? Well, they've got to have the gospel and they've got to have temple ordinances, eternal marriage, and all of that, see. And they'll fall down and be crowned with glory. Now he goes on and says, and they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. This is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel and the richer blessing on the head of Ephraim and his fellows. Why Ephraim and his fellows? Some people have the idea that when we go to Jackson County, we're going to surrender everything to the Indians and just kind of carry water for them. Now that's not it. <clears throat> that's not it. Yes, we want to help redeem the seed of Lehi. We want to help them come to the gospel, and this is a work of service and of assistance and of uplifting. But the keys of the priesthood will always remain with, remain with the birthright tribe. They will always remain there, and uh, they will then, as it says here, in the blessings of Israel and Zion, the richer blessing will be given then to Israel or to Ephraim of the house of Israel. Now, there's another statement I'd like to give you, and this one comes from the angel Moroni's explanation of things to the prophet Joseph Smith on the hill Cumorah, the day after the initial appearances of Moroni to the prophet in his bedroom chamber. The next day, as you recall, the prophet went there to the hill Cumorah. And as he went, he had dollar signs in his eyes because this was a gold record. And he had been so long without very many pennies that it just literally tempted him monetarily. And when he got there, he found the sacred repository. He got himself a stick and he dug the edges around that rock that was rounded on top and that sat over the, uh, the rock uh, uh, container, which, by the way, people went up and saw all the time, and there's reports as late as 1840 that was still there, and people could go see the container where the plates came from. We've got the good uh, minister in the area by the name of Clark who talks about them and having been there in 1840, see. Well, <clears throat> the prophet then unearthed that uh, sacred repository and reached in and was about ready to get it, and he had a real shock come on his system, and it kind of threw him back. and. And uh, being a real powerful and dynamic boy <clears throat> as he was, then he made another effort at it. And he got similarly thrown back, and then he made the comment to himself and kind of out loud, now why can't I get this record? And a voice said to him, because you haven't kept the commandments. <clears throat> and there was Moroni then, again. And then Moroni showed him <clears throat> a vision of the powers of darkness. And Joseph saw the realms of Hades, <clears throat> and he saw the darkness that's there, and he saw <clears throat> the pain and the anguish and the hate and the animosity that's there. And this was so indelibly imprinted upon his mind, his mother later said, that, that he just, it, it just became such a force of resisting evil in him as you uh, can well imagine it would be. Then Moroni opened up the vision of the future and gave him some keys of understanding. And I want to read this. This is the Oliver Cowdery account of it. Uh, he says, I will give you another sign. And when it comes to pass, know that the Lord is God and that he will fulfill his purposes. And to the knowledge which this record contains will go to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people under the whole heaven. This is the sign. When these things begin to be known, that is, when it is known that the Lord shall, has shown you these things, the workers of iniquity will seek your overthrow. They will circulate falsehoods, destroy your reputation, and also will seek to take your life. But remember this, if you are faithful and shall hereafter continue to keep the commandments of the Lord, you shall preserve to bring these things forth. For in due time, he will again give you commandment to come and take them. When they are interpreted, now here's the point I want to get to. When they are interpreted, the Lord will give the holy priesthood to some. So this foreshadows restoration of the priesthood. This is 1823. The Lord will give the holy priesthood to some, and they shall begin to proclaim this gospel and baptize by water. 
And after they have been after that, uh, they shall have power to give the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Then will persecution rage more and more, for the iniquities of men shall be revealed, and those who are not built upon the rock shall seek the overthrow of this church. And then he gives a kind of a sweeping statement, and he says, But it will increase the more opposed and spread farther and farther, and t increasing in knowledge, till they shall be sanctified and receive an inheritance, and note this, and receive an inheritance where the glory of God shall rest upon them. Now, where is that? That's Jackson County, see. They'll increase, the opposition will increase, but they will increase and grow and develop until they get to that point where they receive an inheritance under the consecration program and the glory of the Lord rests upon them. That's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, see. Now they're ready for the coming of the ten tribes because the coming of the ten tribes is they're coming to be crowned with glory by the children of Ephraim. The ten tribes came today. Who among us is going to crown them with glory? Which one of us? We don't have it to give, do we? We've got to be refined and purified as a people. And I'm not just talking about uh, the inactives. I'm talking about the good saints. They've got to be refined and purified in order to receive the endowment of glory. All right, now note Moroni's explanation. But it will increase the more opposed and spread farther and farther, increasing in knowledge, the church will, until they shall be sanctified and receive an inheritance where the glory of God shall rest upon them. Now note, and when this takes place, now there's a point of reference, when this takes place and all things are prepared, the ten tribes of Israel will be revealed in the north country. Now when do they come? Not till Zion is sanctified and endowed with glory. You see that? And when they come, what do they come for? They're gathered to Christ, but not just to baptism. They're gathered to the endowment of glory. They're crowned with glory. They have prophets in their midst. They have ordinances. They have the gospel. They might have had an apostasy and probably did, but they've had a restoration and they are ready. John the Revelator said he was working among them and that he was their priest and their king. Okay? Now it goes on another step further. When this takes place concerning the ten tribes and all things are prepared, the ten tribes are revealed in the north country whether they have been. And then it takes the step one step, the, thing, the, the scenario one step further. And when this is fulfilled, that is when the ten tribes come, when this is fulfilled, will be brought to pass the saying of the prophet. And this is Isaiah, Isaiah 59 and 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. Is Christ going to wait to his world coming in glory to come to Zion? And the answer is no. You're going to see great events take place. He will gather them from the north countries. He will purge out from among them the rebels. He will bring them to Zion. He will talk with them face to face. And he will endow them with glory. And he will then come and dwell with his people. You see that? Now that is one of the preliminary comes, and we want to talk about that a little later here. But, but I want to, to get now into this idea a little more fully uh, beyond now the, the Jacob picture and just make a few clarifications here in, before we conclude and get into some questions. Point number one, Israel is not Israel until she is Zion. Israel is not Israel until she is Zion. Let me turn to Romans chapter 9 just for a minute for a real significant point of clarification. Here's how the, prof, here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in uh, verse 6. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Everyone who's got the blood of Israel is not Israel. Israel is the name of Jesus Christ. It means prince or servant of God. Soldier, prince or soldier of God. And uh, when it's given in its true connotation and received in its true connotation, it is only worthily, only worthily carried by those who are renewed in Christ and born again. 
And so point number one, Israel is not Israel until she is Zion. But that carries the idea even further than that. We don't really become Israel until you really come to what the Lord says Israel has a right to receive. And as he talks about the doctrine of election in the flesh, the appointments now of uh, the blessings of priesthood and of gospel and of temple rights and privileges to a select group called Israel, uh, Paul says this, for example, in Romans 4, 9, verse 4, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? They have the right to be born again. They have the right to the articles of adoption by which to become sons and daughters of Christ. To whom belongs the adoption and the glory? Now, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is referred to by Jewish historians under the name of Shekinah. And uh, it means now this divine presence, this divine presence, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night.